what you have there is someone who is sort of unable to reflect or spending too much time reflecting, if you will, right? Like they're just like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to reflect. And they're really not taking any action. So if you have no reflection and no action, you're basically indifferent to thinking. You're, you're disengaged probably at work and in life. Like you're kind of checked out. Those are terrible places to be, but there are people who are in those spots. So if you are unwilling to reflect and you're kind of paralyzed to take action, that, that's, that's a tough spot to be. But if you are... Uh, Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Being Yourself show, where world's renowned thought leaders and best-selling authors share their wisdom and insight with you so that you can achieve your goals and be a better version of yourself. My name is Ajay Mathur, and my guest today is Dan Pontefract. Dan has given over 600 keynote speeches, including four TED Talks. He has written four best-selling books and is on the way to publish his fifth book this year. Dan writes for Harvard Business Review and Forbes very regularly. His books have got numerous awards, but the one that we will be focusing focusing today on is Open to Think, the book that tells you how exactly you should think. And I'm so delighted to share that I've just now finished reading it <laughs> cover to cover. So without further ado, let's welcome Dan Pontefract. Dan, welcome to the show. Now, Jay, it's so great to be here. Thanks for picking up the trail on how to be an open thinker with the Open to Think book. Can't wait to get into this today with you. So Dan, first question to you is, what's wrong with the way people think today? <laughs> that is an awesome question to, to start with. I, I really think there's three key areas in which we're suffering, the best way to describe it. And I think we've been suffering since I did the research for this book back in 2015 and 2016. So, you know, eight years later, it's still the same. The pandemic Maybe it exacerbated it even more so. So that's maybe perhaps where I'm a little bit more worried. So the three are really as follows. Uh, Ajay, we're busy. And when you look at people's calendars, you know, it's back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings. People are stuffing as much as they can into their nights. People on the weekends are not having any sort of freedom to reign. So the busyness is, is really key for me. Like there's just a lot of doing, a lot of action. The second one comes down to what I call distractedness. And so when you think about people's phones and the notifications that they're getting, or they set them up so that they're getting buzz, or that they look for that little red dot in the corner of their screen that says, oh, so many people liked my picture of a cat who's playing piano. Fantastic, right? We're distracted on our laptops from emails and DMs and Slack messages coming in. Like we're just distracted by so many different points of content and people looking for our time that it's affecting our thinking. And then the third, smaller cohort, but still really important, because of all the information and data that we have at our mercy, there's a fair number of people who are swimming in the data, unable to make decisions or take action because there's just so much that they're almost paralyzed. And they kind of sit on the fence, if you will, without actually taking action or making decisions. So those really are the three key ones that I still observe today uh, in the work that I do with leaders and organizations. And it's really interesting how you linked them with the thinking style in the book, which we'll go in detail. And I totally agree with you that uh, being busy nowadays is also a sort of uh, status symbol. I don't know if that's... Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah it's like, a, well, they call it a badge of honor. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, and, oh, it's a terrible term, terrible. Um, and also about the distractions, it's not just the, because we are so overwhelmed with the information, with whatever is going on in the world, your brain in itself, even if you, when you're sitting alone, you will have a thought coming and distracting you, isn't it? And then you just go into that thought and start thinking about entirely something different. Um, and, and I totally agree with the fan sitters. Uh, there are a lot of people who have a lot of information, but they're just procrastinating on taking a decision. Good stuff. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things that I recommend for people whom, and let's let's be clear, Ajay, like you're going to have thoughts come into your brain, whether you're in the shower on a bike ride, walking through the market, or you're in a meeting and something has triggered something to come into your head. Like you can't control thoughts. They happen. Hmm. But if we ignore those thoughts, then I do think that we're doing ourselves a disservice because some of them are really good. So you have to actually be able to delineate between what are good thoughts that should be recorded 
So whether that's, again, ironically, pulling out your phone and recording that in a note app of some sort, or you have a Moleskine, you know, notebook of some sort, right? And I always carry one around with me so I can jot things down. So, but you have to be able to distinguish between the good and the distracted thoughts that come into your brain. I need to confess something. I wanted to carry something with me all the time. And I had, I had the books. I mean, I, I do write and you can see I have plenty of them. There you go. Nice. But I started using softwares, right? I thought, let's use an app to write down your thoughts. And I used one app. And then after some time, I realized that, oh, this app isn't good enough. So let's change the app. And I changed the app. And then I've got two, three apps. Now I don't know which app to go and record into. <laughs> so I've created it. <laughs> So there, there. Okay. So what you're suffering from is an abundance of options, and the abundance of options kind of theory within open to think or open thinking is that you're unable to distinguish or decide which one of those options you should stick with, right. which then creates the consternation in your brain that you have more options, and so it paralyzes you. You're like, oh my god, which one should I use now? So that's part of our problem here in the 21st century is that this abundance of options actually is impairing our thinking. That is so true. Okay, so to address that, let's jump into the model that you have put together. So before mm -hmm. the model in your introductory chapter, you do speak about uh, different ways people reflect and different ways they act. And based on that, you kind of put people into four different categories, like indifferent, indecisive, inflexible, uh, um, those ones, you know, the uh, the kind I of do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have. So give us more uh, on that because I really liked that. Uh, I thought like this is a good way to understand where do we currently stand so that we can improve ourselves. So let's hypothesize for a second for those that are listening in as opposed to watching uh, your typical or proverbial two by two matrix. Mm -hmm. And on the y axis, let's call that reflection. So our ability to reflect and to conjure up and to sort of just, you know, ponder, let's call it that. And on the x-axis is action. You know, we're executing, we are completing, we are uh, initiating, we are doing. So, you know, you ultimately have the y-axis and the x-axis. And now imagine four quadrants in that x by y axis. And in the kind of two by two matrix, on sort of the, the bottom uh, corner, what you have there is someone whom is sort of unable to reflect or spending too much time reflecting, if you will, right? Like they're just like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to reflect. And they're really not taking any action. So if you have no reflection and no action, you're basically indifferent to thinking. You, you're disengaged probably at work and in life. Like you're kind of checked out. Those are terrible places to be, but there are people who are in those spots. So if you are unwilling to reflect, and you're kind of paralyzed to take action, that, that's that's a tough spot to be. But if you are, uh, differently, if you are reflecting all the time, so to your point of which note app should I use? And so that's a reflection moment. And if you don't take any action with which note app to use, you're suffering from essentially you know paralysis by analysis. So you're fence sitting. And so if you are all reflection and low or no action, in essence, you know, you're indecisive. So you're, you're, you're stopped in your tracks because you're thinking too much about options. Now, if you now reverse that and say, well, what if I didn't reflect at all and I jumped straight to action? So no reflection, jump to action. Well, those types of people are inflexible because they've, quickly decided what they've got to do and off they go and they take action. And ultimately what they've done to themselves and most likely their peers or the team members that they're, they're leading is cause angst and stress because they're just jumping right in without any proper time to reflect, to marinate, to say, should we do this, Ajay? And ultimately they end up probably redoing things because of that. And obviously the best case scenario is the right balance between how much time we take to reflect on our options, on our ideation, on our brainstorming, on our critical decisions, you know, ultimately the how do we decide based on the facts and the data, and then we take action. And here's the kind of thing about the two by two, Ajay. Um, if we're not following the model, which I call dream, decide, do, repeat, if we don't repeat, i.e. if we don't reflect and evaluate how we're doing in the doing, 
then why did we do the whole thing in the first place? The whole point is to be a continuous learner. So as much as I have the two by two matrix of your reflection and your action, and really up at the top, um, up, at the, up at the top right there, that's your open. open thinking model, right? You also have to think about the iteration of the whole thing. And that is the repeat part of dream, decide, do, repeat. Okay, great. And then this, this particular chart that you described so well gives people an idea where do they stand and for which you have come up with a thinking model, which includes your creative, critical, and applied thinking all. So tell us a little bit more about that also so that I can go deep into one of those uh, uh, things. Fantastic, yeah. And uh, you've done a really good job there as a segue into, well, there's the two-by-two two matrix. Where do you stand? Like, are you are you jumping straight to action? Are you spending too much time in reflection? But really, it's a cycle. I mean, and that's, I, I got to be honest, I am basically stealing from my grade five teacher, Mrs. Guyot. So when I was a kid growing up in Canada, my grade five teacher, Mrs. Guyot, sort of in our class of whatever, 20 kids or so, she implored us to be creative and critical thinkers, kind of like almost at the same time. So this kind of cycle of, hey, kids, you know, we, we learned how to whiteboard. Let's get on the chalkboard. We didn't have whiteboards back then. I'm old. So we had chalkboards. And so we were as kids. We we're like able to use the chalkboard, get all dusty and chalk all over you. And we were like thinking of ideas for our little projects that we were doing. And then Mrs. Guy would force us as well to do critical thinking, i.e. decision making, take out the bad ones, what's not going to work, what could work, might we try this, how do we iterate? And then as, you know, whether it was a science class or an English class, you know, then we had to go do the science, so we had to apply it, or we had to go write the essay or write the kind of the, the book report or whatever it was. And it dawned on me, Mrs. Guy, as I got into executive roles at places like SAP and TELUS, that she was kind of right that far too many people jump to applied thinking, the doing. And there are some people that sit in the creative and critical thinking, like just meandering in that moment. It's like she sort of forced us to think about really three stages. Now, I don't remember what she called it, but it was just ingrained in me that that's what we should be doing as kids. And it sort of stuck with me. So, you know, kudos, Mrs. Guyot out there for helping me, little 11-year-old dad at the time, thinking about thinking. So I'm basically stealing from Mrs. Guy. So that's this, that's my point. It's simple, Ajay. If we are just if we're thinking about a model like open to think, it is as simple as grade five. Creative thinking are those opportunities to brainstorm to ideate, but don't spend too much time in that in that um, stage. Critical thinking is when you make judicious decisions. How do you decide? Is it individual? Is it consensus? Is it mandatory? Uh, is it incremental? Is it iterative? And then, of course, there's applied thinking, which sounds like an oxymoron, but you're taking the creative and critical decision-making uh, uh, stages and you're executing, you're doing, you're executing on what it is that you've decided to do. So thus, you're applying your thinking. And then, of course, what circles it all is repeat. Mm -hmm. So not being stuck and almost pompous enough to say, well, we said we were going to do this. We did it. Of course, it's good. Well, maybe it's not. That's okay, too. So that's the iteration point, right? About after applied thinking, can you go back and evaluate and say, well, how do we do? Do we have to tuck in a new idea? Do we have to do something different to sort of massage it in a better way? Is it possible then for you to share some real life example, like maybe you've encountered in your work, some business problem wherein you advised people to, you know, go step by step, creative thinking, critical thinking, and then applied thinking, something that can... Uh, that we can see that, oh, this is how it works. Well, I'll give you two examples, one where it went belly up uh, terribly and one where it was much better. So, and I'll I'll take the names out because I don't want to, you know, hurt anyone based on the, the particular examples. So in this, this particular situation, you have a sales team that was selling a bill of goods to a very large government agency. And these services and this bill of goods, uh, the team that was selling it just sort of went myopically down a track and said, definitely we can do this for you. And so please sign on the dotted line. And they went kind of straight to applied thinking. And the customer essentially, in this case, the government agency said, okay, let's sign on the dotted line. 
Now, what the sales team did not do was the sales team did not involve other stakeholders within the company in the creative or the critical thinking phases. And consequently, because they didn't come up with some of those early ideas to test what could work, what couldn't work, and then make decisions on what could work and what couldn't work, the sales team ultimately sold the government agency that about six months later blew up, like literally did not work. Mm -hmm. And it created such a public disaster because here's an organization that was publicly traded, you know, in the news a lot. And what could have been prevented was not because people jumped to the sale, which is applying thinking without really doing the first two phases. And the amount of money lost and the amount of time spent to fix the situation, like quadruple the amount of time that would have could have been saved by involving other people in the creative and critical thinking stages. Mm. So there are actually dire consequences at times, right? That where that can happen. I'll give you another um, example I can share that's not mine, but a, a, a one that's in the news. So it's not mine. I can say the company. When uh, Samsung was trying to beat Apple to the release of iPhone 7, the Samsung executives decided to push their people, their engineers, their QA testers, et cetera, to say, you will beat Apple to the release of iPhone 7. And so Samsung Galaxy 7, infamously known as the phone that used to blow up, uh, you know, in airplanes and cars and people's houses was a disaster. It was a $5.3 billion write down. Why? Why did, why did Samsung lose $5.3 billion? Because executives pushed their people to beat Apple to the release of iPhone 7. And between the engineers and the testers, they missed this very detrimental engineering flaw in the phone itself between the battery and essentially the ignition when the, the phone turned on. And boom. So when we are put like with these time pressures and people are sleeping under their desks and spending 20 hours at the office, like they, people lost their minds, so to say, and they could not see in the creative and critical thinking stages their own errors. And there you go, $5.3 billion. So there's two examples, one mine, one from Samsung, where if you just paused and involved more people and were creative and critically thinking before you applied it, you're going to save yourself like literally millions of dollars uh, in savings of both money and in time. So no. uh, yeah, go ahead. No, you go on, carry on. Well, I was gonna I was gonna give you a good example, but you ask your question, and I'll come back to it. Okay. Now I was just going to ask you, so what advice do you give to the leaders who are uh, looking to foster a more open, creative, and you know, innovative culture at the workplace? You know, one of the words that you just used there. I want to really hone in on. And as much as the book is called Open to Think, you know, slow down and and basically make better decisions. Uh it's it actually comes down to culture. It's actually a leadership behavior, both leading self and if you're lucky enough to lead others. So that's kind of where I come in. You know, I, I do I thank you by the way. It is a model, creative, critical, applied thinking, you know, dream decide do repeat. But it really is also the culture that you're trying to create as a company, as an organization, as a team, as a business unit. Both the example I used with the government agency that ended up costing gazillions of dollars and Samsung, those actually are culture issues. So how do you become a culture of open thinkers is really kind of your question. And that's really down to how your organization views creative, critical, and applied thinking. If your organization does not have the um, gumption, does not have the uh, courage to inculcate a culture where it allows people, allows people, sorry, to, to pause, to, for example, have no meeting Thursdays, to have library hours on Wednesday afternoon, to have checks and balances in your kind of thinking culture that says, hey, did we involve enough people in this? Did we have the right stakeholders before we go ahead? Hey, uh, what is our decision-making model for this particular project? I.e., is it consensus? 
Is it uh, the CEO has the final say? Whatever it is, are people fully aware of the creative, the critical, and the applied thinking stages? Where are we at in our stages? Like that's open dialogue. That's systemic leadership behavioral change that's needed. And yes, you know, Ajay, I, I joke about our phones. I joke about the notifications, right? I joke about us being distracted and busy. And those are definitely terrible things that are happening. But if you want to prevent that government issue I talked about and the Samsung issue I talked about, you're going to have an open thinking culture. And that comes down to leaders. And surprisingly, many companies do have core values, like all the companies have core values, but how many of them are really living the core values? That's a big question. They just give people who join new a leaflet, which has their four or five core values written. That's it. That's all the communication they have about core values. <laughs> well, you know, and that sort of begs the question, if you call them core values and they're not core or valued, what the hell are you doing as an organization? But it does happen, right? I mean, I've seen it. It's my personal experience without taking any name. I've seen it's it's there. It's written on the walls and everything, but <laughs> care. I was just gonna, I'm laughing because there's been so many organizations in which I walk into the lobby and, you know, on the wall are there three, four, five core values. And then I'm, I'm there to actually do some organizational consulting on, on their culture. And the people are saying, oh, my God, yeah, don't listen to those. We don't believe in those things at all. <laughs> okay. So they are so nice. They're at, at least honest that they're admitting it. Yeah. I mean, exactly. It, it keeps me employed, I guess, Ajay, but I feel bad for all the people. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's uh, we've touched upon a few times already about distraction. And especially in, in the book, you write extensively about distraction, especially in the area of critical thinking. And um, also, I think you mentioned at one place that it takes around 20 minutes to focus back once mm. distracted, right? That's astonishing because a lot of people think that they can do multitask very well, but in a way, it's not really working because of uh, when you're switching tasks, you're also taking the, what do you, what do you call it, residue, uh, task residue or something, there's a word for yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, so you take that to the next task and it impacts on your performance on it. So. Um, Give us more tips on how one should effectively do multitasking. Well, let, let's unpack just this conversation with you and me for a second, Ajay. So we are recording this on Zoom. You are in two different parts of the world. You're in one time zone. I'm in another. And it's very late in between our two time zones, uh, if you will. Imagine if I had on my end over here not put a do not disturb on my Mac. So I use a Mac. And my do not disturb my focus so that I could imagine I'm getting inundated with direct messages from LinkedIn, Slack messages from some of my clients that I work with who have Slack channels, emails, which come all day, every day, uh, texts, which I typically use texts only with family members and a few close friends, but nonetheless, texts. Imagine if I'm with you right now in this moment recording this lovely conversation we're having, and I am. Over here, over here, over here, over here. Wait a second. Looking down at my phone. How, how does that do a service to you or our time together or people who might be listening in or watching in on this conversation of ours? I mean, I know it's a rhetorical question, obviously, right? It's terrible. It's terrible for you. I've wasted your time. It's terrible for me because now I'm only giving you a portion of my attention and my focus. But I'm also equally giving a portion of my attention and focus to those that are looking for something from me because I might not answer that text or that DM. I might look at it and say, oh, and then I'm distracted from you and the conversation that we've been having. So now, why I bring up this conversation between you and I is that's amplified a billion times over every day between leaders and their teams or team member to team member, team member to customer, team member to partner, to supplier. It's just, it's endless. And I think our, the way in which that we, Ajay, have forgotten how to stay focused and our belief that we can multitask our way through the day has actually added to the stress, the anxiety, and the burnout issues that are now much higher than they were 10 years ago. 
Then, which obviously, as we talked about, the book was written before the pandemic, and I will write an update to this book post-pandemic. But now with the pandemic, you know, and people, a lot of knowledge workers, if you will, uh, having to stay home and realize that they like staying home, but now it's almost been created this version of themselves where they must be multitaskers because that's all they've got. They've got themselves, right, at home. And so their loneliness, they think, is being eradicated by the multiple instances of connections that are coming in. And so there's this dopamine hit that's now on steroids, and they feel they think they feel less lonely, but in fact, they're doing a disservice to their creative, critical, and applied thinking. Like, it's just, it's a mess, I must say. And I sound like an old, cantankerous, agitated man. And, and I don't mean to be that person. But what I do see from the data, my research, my interviews, is that we are not taking control of our focus time. We are not setting up the parameters for us in our calendar so that we can have that breathing space. I, I talked about like library hours or Friday afternoons or like no meeting days. You know, we, we ultimately are mostly in control of our calendars and sometimes not. Sometimes there's meetings that have to happen with a customer. Sometimes the boss calls a meeting. So you have to kind of work around that. But what are you doing to create focus time in your calendar? You know, I, I've, I've always had bosses and I've always been a boss. But I would always set up times in my calendar, 30 minutes here, you know, an hour here, like the, I call it actually DP time, like Dan Pontifract, DP. So if you're not creating the conditions in your own day and week where you have some me time, in my case, some DP time, some Ajay time, like kind of shame on you because you are in control of your time for the most part. So what are you doing to make sure that you are in control of it? And in addition to that, you also need to know how to say no, because that's kind of external destruction that keeps coming from every direction, isn't it? The culture of yes, or this, I guess, um, unwillingness to say no, is detrimental to the health, the mental uh, wellness and health and well-being, sorry, of, of people. Because it's just creating a compacted pile-on effort of, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, I'll, I can take that on. And again, like, let's not just blame the individual for saying yes. I also have equal blame for leaders who don't see through the fact that they are asking more of their team members than they can handle. And when the leader is not aware of their load balance, so i.e. the team member's ability, if they don't know or can't see how and what is on the team member's plate already, and they just keep adding more, then they don't understand load balance. And when you don't understand load balance as a leader, what are you doing? You're just adding more on and asking to draw blood from a stone. And the resulting consequence, Ajay, is of course, increased stress, anxiety, and burnout and mental un uh, and emotional unwellness. Those aren't good things. So to me, it's all related. How we set up our cultures, our leadership behaviors to with a fiduciary responsibility to care about the health and well-being of that team or is related to creative, critical, and applied thinking. How do you recommend one can do multitasking effectively? <laughs> because you, we are kind of, we are multitasker anyways, right? We will do it. We have to, there is no other choice. So how do yeah, you? Yeah, I think, so I, what, I mean, there's things that'll work for other people. What works for me are micro breaks. Hmm. Right. So, you know, whether I mean, I'm not going to take a micro break in the middle of a podcast recording with you, of course. Right. This is like this is kind of like the one on one meeting. So if I'm having a one on one meeting with a team member, I'm not checking my email or my phone and being distracted. Of course, I am in the moment. But if I'm like writing as an example, so that's one on one time with me. So Dan and Dan time, I might write for 13, 12, 15 minutes and I'll give myself like a two minute reward, three minute reward, where I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm answering something, I might answer a couple emails. So if you're writing a consulting report, if you're writing code, you know, if you are, uh, if you're a team member, and you have a boss, and you, like you're answering phones from a customer service perspective, 
What if the boss, the leader, the team lead was saying, you know what? We want you to answer four calls and then you get three minutes to yourself. That's kind of multitasking because you're not you're not saying we don't want you to check your phone. You're just saying, look, here you go. Answer four calls and then you get two, three minutes. Just, you know, check your Instagram. And then if you're cool with that, we're not going to hover over you and make sure you're not checking your phone during the calls because there's a trust thing that we've developed there. And there's a good team norm that we've uh, established for each other. That's what I'm getting at, Ajay. Like, how can we be leaders of self, give ourselves those breaks, but also leaders of team and find ways knowing that there are so many entry points of connection, of notifications, of content, and so on, uh, that we create the conditions for it to be successful. Yes, Dan, absolutely. And I would like to add one more point. We need to be mindful on to what we are doing in those breaks. You know, the term that I was forgetting was attention residue. And that is when, let's say, you're taking a break and you're going to an Instagram video, and that video is something that will remain in your brain for next 20 minutes or 30 minutes, then it's not really a break break, isn't it? Well, and that's just it, right? There are some people who believe that, you know, to fill the bucket of uh, of hope, of uh, re-energized self is those Instagram and TikTok checks, right? And say, oh, so cool. I saw, you know, the, the dancing cat now playing piano, not just sitting and still, but actually dancing. What a great cat video, right? That's not filling you up with the right type of re-energy that we're talking about. Like mindful moments are what I call those. Not not that, but the ones I'm talking about next. And that are, you know, the the three-minute walk, the getting outside, the breathing of fresh air, the taking a moment maybe with the Calm app or something and just having a meditative marinating in the moment moments. Those are really important as well. It's not just uh, breaks from the doing to do more doing. It's actual little micro breaks to refuel and replenish you know, your, your mindfulness ultimately. And, and those are j- like probably more important than the little micro breaks that are attending to your email and your DMs and so on. I'm so glad that we're talking about it because many people do consider breaks as, you know, have a break and watch TV in it, have a break and do some social media in it, have a break and do something in it, just, which is actually. <laughs> well, so, I mean, as a, I, I, as a kid that as a teenager grew up in the eighties, And kind of my first jobs, obviously, were in the mid-90s after going to my university undergrad. The smoke break was the funniest thing I ever thought of, right? It was it was kind of like people went, took a break for 15 minutes, they went outside and they harmed themselves with smoking. I was like, how is this a break? (laughs) This is this should be called the smoke curse, not the smoke break. I never understood it. So to your point, right? We do need those mindful moments ultimately that are healthy and not, you know, akin to a smoke break. Absolutely. And smoke breaks still do happen. It's not 90s. I know. I just don't get it. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thanks, Dan. There's one question I, I had in mind. You might have heard about chat GPT, of course, right? And uh, when we're talking about thinking, with the advancement of artificial intelligence, there has been a concern about you know the potential impact on human thinking and human decision-making abilities because of uh, so much of AI helping you do those things. What are your thoughts on that issue? Yeah, so I love it, first of all, where we're at with AI. I mean, this was coming a long time ago. I remember doing, uh, being part of a ChatGPT 2.5 example many moons ago before it got to 3.5 and soon 4.0 uh, in, uh, in the next few weeks here. It's akin, Ajay, to the calculator. We were, again, I'm a certain vintage and age, we were worried about bringing calculators into the classroom. Oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to teach kids how to think or how to compute or how to do math. And at the end of the day, part of that is true. I think there's fundamentals, right, in maths that you have to teach. Like you can't not know nine times nine like you can't know not know what a square root might be not necessarily the square root of 6412 but just what does square root mean and so on right but i'm not asking you potentially to think like not everyone's going to do an algebraic equation in their head they're going to potentially need a tool to help them and that tool in this case let's just call it the calculator so analogously, let's go over to chat GDP and, and AI in general. If we don't teach ourselves and we don't teach human beings to think first, and we believe that we would outsource the thinking to chat GPTs and AI, then we're in trouble. Hmm. 
if we believe systemically that AI and chat GPTs are tools to help us think, then we're on to something. Then we're on to what it was like with the calculator in the classroom. So I'm all for chat GPT. I think it can unlock writer's block, for example. I think it can help you begin the makings of an email. And then you're like, yeah, that's not good. Let me tweak it. I think it can save time, just like a calculator can save time in computation. But if we are creating conditions in which we teach our kids, our young adults, et cetera, to be unable to think, and we're outsourcing the thinking to chat GPTs and artificial intelligence, then we have ourselves a really, really big issue. So true. I tested chat GPT for Dan, and I asked it, asked it you know Dan, your full name, Dan Pontefract? And yes. Yes. I know Dan, he's written these these books. I said, okay, fine. Can you summarize Open to Think for me? And it went on summarizing it. It wrote two paragraphs. It was, I would say, 60% correct because I asked that question after I finished reading the book. So I knew what exactly is in the book. And Chat GPT kind of tried to make sense of the topic and it knew the headings and then it tried to make, you know, what could have been written. Probably it has not read the book or something. Uh, so the point is, it's a good tool if you know how to use it intelligently. But it may give, at the moment, with the current version, gives a lot of false information. And I think that's kind of the point. Like, also, there's an evolutionary perspective here to artificial intelligence, right? It's going to get better. And I think, however, like, what we need to be doing is thinking right now, at this stage and where artificial intelligence is, what do we want to do in terms of thinking about our thinking? Do we believe, like, are we, are we raising children? Are we raising teenagers? Are we raising young adults to think that it's okay for the first year university essay assignment to just say, hey, chat GPT, write me an essay on the pros and cons of World War II? Or are you teaching children and young adults, right, to use what's at our fingertips as a mechanism to help them not only unearth perhaps ideas, but then to formulate some opinion, but it has to be their opinion, not AI's opinion. Correct. And I think that's where we can go wrong if we're not teaching uh, our kids ultimately that AI is a tool and not the thinking device. In very near future, I think we'll have to teach people how to think. We are already teaching your book is, is there, one of the things, right? But I'm going, I'm talking about the more rudimentary level thinking. If we kind of start being dependent on tools that are available, then people will say, oh, you know, I can find it. I can ask ChatGP to do this for me. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe we'll see in future. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll add this. Leaders also have to be weary of this. And and I'm not saying weary from the perspective of, you know, lights are falling off the ceiling and we're not going to be able to drive anymore. But if we are struggling at this particular point to ask the question, well, what is ChatGPT or AI going to do for us? And we're thinking about it from the education perspective, perhaps only. I do wonder what leaders are thinking about right now with AI. So will we use AI and not lose sight of our humanity, our humanness, our humaneness. So what are we doing as leaders, right, to think about how AI inevitably can replace some of the functions that are in our organizations today? And so what do we do with those people? What do we do with the people who's, um, who are bookkeepers or who are data processing agents or who are some, in some cases, you know, uh, answering emails or customer service requests, et cetera, live. Are we going to use AI as a tool to help the organization um, decrease costs and only that by outsourcing it and thus replacing people? Or are we going to use it again as a tool to help the culture of the organization, the customer experience, and not lose sight of the fact that A, I is not human. <laughs> it doesn't have feelings. Humans have feelings, ultimately. Yeah. You, you remember the Google had this leak last year, and then they had to fire an employee. 
uh, about how human the AI is going to be. Okay. Exactly. And I think one of the other things we, we, we can look at are um, what are the repercussions? Like if we're not thinking as leaders where the repercussions may be with that use of AI, with leaked data, with you know f phases of our um, kind of iteration and the culture, Again, we've got, there are some serious, tough questions to answer if leaders, back to our original point in this conversation, if we are too myopic and we're just jumping to the applied thinking and not, to bring it right back, Ajay, bringing in the creative and critical thinking parts about AI, we have got some serious issues that are going to happen downstream uh, into our futures for sure. Yeah, very, very, very well linked to that with the thinking style. Really, <laughs> okay. And then, um, you have uh, written so many books, and you are releasing one more book this year. I wanted to know, you know, what inspired you to write? I mean, what's your inspiration behind writing? And also tell us about your next upcoming book, which is Work Life Bloom. Oh, so kind of you. Um, I think first of all. Mrs. Guyatt, back to grade five, I think maybe she unleashed some of that writing bug in me. I've always wanted to write. I've always been writing. I wrote songs as a young kid. I wrote poems, right? And then as I got into sort of the leadership, the culture space, et cetera, um, I started putting together my thoughts and started out really with a book when I started writing in 2011, 2012 with, with Flat Army, which is a culture book, a, a kind of culture, corporate culture change book. And so the question, first of all, because you have two there, they're brilliant. Why I write is I hope to be of some sort of benevolent assistance to others as I procure stories and ideas and do research about what's working and sometimes what's not and the delta gap between the two. So I think I've been put on this earth to kind of be a translator because I've always said the future of work is now. It's not it's not in the future. It's now. So how can we learn from past mistakes and past triumphs to you know learn something? And hopefully I may not have the answer, but I hope I'm building upon the backs of giants before us to say, well, here's another way to look at it. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you, just like today with you and I. And Work Life Bloom, the the fifth book, sadly, <laughs> is uh is an attempt to say, well, is work life balance working? And I don't think it is. I think work-life balance is a lie. I believe it's a zero-sum game. I don't see any way in which for it to ever become something that is actually achieved. However, uh, I do believe that leaders have it in them to help team members bloom in both their work and their lives. And so what I set out to do was to ask myself, well, what, Ajay, might be those conditions or the factors that allow a team member to thrive, to flourish, to bloom, you know, in both work and life. Because ultimately, as we both know, we bring our work into our lives every day, and we bring our lives into our work every day. There's, there's, no, there's no balance. It doesn't, because you, it's not a thing. Like you don't balance the two, and you don't really integrate the two. You've got to find the conditions that allow you in your work and your life actually to excel. And I believe that leaders have a responsibility in that equation. And I think we've ignored it for far too long. We've just sort of said, oh, we'll let them work from home on Fridays or, oh, you know, we'll allow them to go see their kids dance recital on Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock. That's not balance. Right. But there are very significant factors that can help us achieve that blooming state. I'm so excited to hear more about it. And with that commentary, I'm definitely going to get it when it's uh, available. I think, when is it coming? Uh, the end of the year, like uh, the end of October, beginning of November of 2023. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe when it comes, then we can catch up again and talk about the book. I'd love to. Let's continue this dialogue. We're, we're all in a waterfall of discourse. So let's uh, enjoy each other's company and figure out what does work life bloom actually mean. I love that, Ajay. Yeah, and, and thank you very much for writing books, because for me, I mean, I've not written my first book yet. It, it may be very soon, but there is a lot of insight and, uh, you know, wisdom that we can get from books. So it's a my personal thing. My channel is dedicated to authors. I do talk to authors because I really admire them that they have put together all their, you know, years of experience into one 300-page book. 
for you to read, you know, see the case studies and you know what exactly is happening. So it's really, really helpful to the world, I would say. So keep writing, <laughs> maybe six thoughts. Well, I can't wait to read your first book and please keep doing this. I mean, um, Ajay, what you're doing to help spread the word of the word from authors is highly respected. We we need more Ajays in this world that are digging into books like Open to Think, uh, thinking about writing their own books to get your opinion and your knowledge and your ideas into the world as well. Just keep doing both for me if you can. Great. Thank you very much. I'll uh, keep in touch with you and I'll tell you what are the developments. Look forward to it. Okay. And thanks for this today. Oh, there's one last question, Dan, which I ask all my guests, and uh, which is what, according to you, are the top three skills that one needs in order to be fulfilled and happy in life, but schools are not teaching? Ooh, I like that. So I would say, first of all, purpose slash meaning. So a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. This is not nefarious topic. It's something that we need. We need to find that fulfillment, that sense of self, that worth, that meaning. So that's number one. I think number two is what we talked about today. The open thinker, the open to think kind of concept. If we're not willing to make changes in how we operate as human beings in our uh, creative, critical, and applied thinking, that's that's bad news going forward. And then the third one, which we need more of, really, at the end of the day, is empathy. If if we're not teaching people how to be empathic, how to ultimately understand there's three types of empathy, which I call head, heart, and hands. What are people thinking? What are they feeling? And what can we do about it? Gosh, that's going to go a long way to, to healing and to, to having a much better society. So far, then I've asked this question to around 70 people and empathy is at the top of the chart. <laughs> well, that's probably because it's missing in very many cases and we need more of that. Okay, great. It was amazing. So, so much of knowledge that you have shared with us about, you know, how and how we should organize the way we think and how we should act in order to be better, in order to be more productive. Thank you very much for that, Dan. I really appreciate your time today to be here with us. The pleasure, honestly, was all mine. I'm so glad that even though the book came out five years ago, Ajay, that you picked it up and were willing to have a chat about it. And as I mentioned to you in the green room, it's probably my best-selling and latest book that's allowing me to do keynotes and workshops because people are waking up to the fact that uh, we need to think better. So uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Exactly. And the guys, this is because the book is timeless. There is it, there is nothing 2018 and 19-ish about it. It will be relevant even in 2030. So I do uh, appreciate if you can get a copy of it and read about you know how we should be organizing our thoughts and it will really help you be more productive, be able to manage your time better, be able to be a better decision maker, and a lot more. So do check it out. I'll put all the links of Dan's website and his book and everything in the comment section below. If you have not yet done so, then this is the time to hit the subscribe button and uh, so that you know about my future videos. I will come back again with another amazing author. Until then, you take care and keep learning.